our 14th webinar in our virtual event series. And each Wednesday, we highlight a different region of the world with either a tourism board or a destination specialist or with many of our travel partners and experts that truly know the area and the product that we're spotlighting. And today's no different. Now, I recognize that the word luxury may be a bit overused in the travel industry, but I can say with confidence that Mikado embodies everything you think of when you think of luxury. And by the way, you're on a safari, so it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> with that, I'll turn it over to Pamela Foster with Mikado Safaris to give you a look into what really makes Mikado stand apart. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and I uh, appreciate you all spending some time with me today. So without any delay, I'm going to get moving on the slide presentation. I know that we're all kind of tired of this pandemic and a lot of you are thinking ahead about where to go for 2021. Um, a lot of your magazines out there are telling you that you should be going into Africa uh, on a safari. We're one of the top 10 destinations for 2021. So that's all good news. Um, and because of the pandemic, you're looking for places that can give you that wide open spaces, but can also give you that life-changing experience. So we uh, operate in two different areas of the world, Africa and India, and each are very different and offer very different experiences but both are up there on the top list. I'm going to spend a little bit of time starting out with, with Africa because Africa on most parts is phased opening right now. And most people right now will be planning their bucket list trip into Africa. You start planning about eight to 12 months out and everything that you're looking for, spacing, wide open spacing, cultural interaction, safety, etc., is waiting for you in Africa. I've been in Africa 50 to 60 times on safari that many times. I've been going backwards and forwards for about 40 years and every single time it's life changing. You will see a lot of wildlife in Africa. Yes, you will be up close and personal. It could be just that you're right next to one single animal, or you could be sitting amongst a vast herd of animals. And every day is different in Africa. So you have uh, the alone in Africa feeling, but you're having all this excitement of different experiences every day. And that's what Africa is all about. We are family run and family owned, and the family maintains uh, the ancestral home in India as well as a home in Nairobi where they now live. And they also have a, a second home in Cape Town. So everything about this company is personal. I wanna just briefly discuss with you COVID in these destinations because that's what's most prevalent at the moment. If you look at the Africa continent, there's 55 countries in Africa. It has about 17% of the world's population has about 5% of the COVID cases and less than 1% of the deaths from COVID. That's across 55 countries. So the COVID count is very, very low in Africa. If you're looking at India, it has the second largest population in the world. And at the moment, about uh, 2 million cases of COVID and about 38,000 deaths. Now you compare that to the United States where we're living, uh, we have like four and a half million cases and of course we have 150,000 deaths. So COVID in these destinations is not uh, a concern of yours. What you may be concerned about is getting there and getting back safely. And as the international uh, airlines pick up their services again, as countries in Africa and India open again, you'll find that there'll be new protocols and safety measures. Those countries in Africa that have opened, like Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, um, they have uh, currently a requirement uh, of a COVID negative test that you take within hours of departing the United States and uh, that holds you good inside the country. You all know that this is all very fluid. Tomorrow it'll be different. And as we go into 2021, this is all going to change completely. You know, we hopefully for a vaccine, antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. And there'll be a new procedure at all the international airports. 
So let's just talk to you about what happens when you arrive in Africa. People talk to you about a day on safari and most people have no clue what that means. So I'm gonna take you through a typical day on safari in Africa. I'm then going to talk to you about different parts of Africa that you may want to know the differences so you can understand where to travel. Um, after that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about India, which is completely different than Africa. And I hope you'll stay with me to hear a bit about why I hope you'll consider traveling with Mikado. So let's take a typical day on safari. I'm using the traditional safari destination of Kenya for this example. And I'm going to use uh, the famed tented camp. So somewhere in the early morning, between 5 and 6 a.m., depending on the time of the year, you're going to hear a voice outside the tent calling to you. Jambo, Jambo, that's the wake-up call. They bring a hot beverage into your tent with something like a breakfast biscuit. It's not breakfast. It's just the wake up call. They want you to get up, get dressed as quick as possible, and you will be departing the camp for your first game drive of the day. Regardless of the destination, you will do two game drives every day. So if you're in South Africa, same procedure, East Africa, same procedure. Be prepared. You're going to leave your camp for two and a half to three hours. So you want to take everything with you, your cameras, uh, layered clothing, anything that you might need during that time. You'll get into your safari vehicles and you'll go with your guide out onto the plains of Africa. And you'll be tracking, searching for different breeds of animals. You may be right up close to an individual animal, or you may be sitting in the middle of a vast hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wild, uh, wildebeest. Um, what is exciting about Africa is you just don't know what's around the corner. You don't know if the lion pride is just out of sight. You don't know if you're going to come around the corner and run straight into an elephant. So your day starts with anticipation. And one of the best times of the day to be on safari is, of course, in the early morning. And that's because wildlife are just like us. They need food and water. So if you can get to a water hole or a river first thing at daybreak, you will see lots of animals. And it doesn't matter what destination you're in in Africa, you'll see a lot of varieties and a lot of breeds of animal and you will be up close to the animals. About halfway through that morning game drive, they stop. For, let's just call it coffee break. And you get out of your vehicles and you talk to the people that you're traveling with or to your guide. You talk about what has happened in the early part of your drive and what you anticipate to see in the second part of your drive. Once you've had that chat and time to socialize a bit, you'll get back in your vehicles and you'll spend the next hour or an hour and a half in search of perhaps some of the species that you didn't see earlier on. Maybe that elusive leopard might be out there somewhere and they start tracking for it. Your breakfast is always back at your camp or lodge. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't because your camp staff sometimes surprise you and you just come around the corner on the plains of Africa and there they are. They're cooking your breakfast over open flames in the middle of Africa and you sit down on the plains of Africa for breakfast. Following breakfast at your camp, there's free time. So what do you do on a free time? Well, quite often, and the most popular thing that people do do is they go on a bushwalk. You know, they take one of the naturalists or one of the guides and they go and leave the camp for about an hour and you walk and see all the small things in Africa that you miss from a vehicle. You may be one of those people that just want to relax, find a spot at the camp and look for the animals moving around the camp. A lot of camps are on watering holes or rivers and you can just watch animals coming and going. The majority of uh, luxury camps do have swimming pools and facilities. You may want to switch out the morning game drive to take a balloon trip up and over the savannah. The balloon rides uh, basically glide along at treetop level and you look down on the wildlife and you would land the balloon somewhere and you'd have a champagne breakfast in the middle of Africa. You have lunch at your camp and most camps have chefs. 
They can take care of any dietary need you have. The food is fantastic. You will put on weight when you travel through Africa. And I also think you'll put on weight when you eat in India as well. And after lunch, you still have a little bit of free time. So people may take up a book, may take a nap. Most camps will have at least a masseuse available. Some have a full gym. Majority of them have swimming pools where you can relax. Personally, I take the nap because every day you have two game drives and about mid afternoon they'll call you for the typical traditional afternoon tea and yeah they'll give you coffee but it's an English tradition of gathering and when you gather for this you're really gathering to meet before you go out on the second game drive and usually you leave the camp 3 30 ish and you'll go out in the late afternoon and again you'll be away from your camp for about two and a half, three hours. And why I'm not exactly sure how long is because if you are seeing something really exciting, you don't want to leave. You don't want to go back to the camp. You want to stay where you are and look at the wildlife. So those things that you've missed in the morning, they may be on search of in the afternoon. You may have had wonderful game viewing in the morning and you may go back to the same area or you may journey on to a completely different area looking for cats or elephants if you are an alley person whatever you have discussed with your guide they're going to track and see that they can get you as close as possible so for the first hour or so in the afternoon you'll be doing game viewing and game spotting with your guides stopping to take photographs uh, sometimes the animals you could just about reach out of the vehicle and touch them you don't want to but they're that close we take a break, just kind of like late afternoon, and uh, they call the sundowners. Usually your guide will find um, a rise somewhere where you can look out over the plains or a clear, clear field in front of him where they set up for what I call happy hour bush style. I love having the iPhones and the digital cameras nowadays because if someone else in my party has a great photograph, I can use AirDrop and get them to drop the photograph onto my camera or onto my iPhone so I can have the same photography. And it's again time to chat and, and share experiences. The second half of the game drive in the late afternoon generally is heading you back towards the camp. Uh, quite often you don't realize how many miles you've covered going out on the game viewing and in most cases in East Africa they try to get you back to the camp uh, before night in other words just after the sun sets if you're running late they will spot game with spotlights in the dark for you so you can have a partial night drive if you tend to go into South Africa or Southern Africa, they deliberately hold you out in the bush until it is night. And then they generally spot game on the way back to the lodge or camp. Your night dinner is held at the camp. And most camps, depending on the size, will try to vary the location of the dinner for you. One night you might have it inside. My favorite is dining out under the Africa stars, like you see on the screen at the moment where they cook your meal right in front of you and you sit there and enjoy the evening outdoors. The last part of your safari day is usually gathered around a campfire or bonfire. You're having a um, nightcap and everyone is telling the stories of the day. And this is where those stories, um, you can dine out on them for months because they really get very tall stories at this hour of the night that uh, baby giraffe was actually 15 feet tall, the lion was actually in the vehicle with you. But you bring all these memories back with you. I generally slip away and get to my bed because the next day on safari starts very early again with that morning wake up call. Now, it doesn't matter what country you are on safari in, the day runs very similar and always will give you two game drives. I'm going to talk about differences now because people do ask me, if you're in Africa, where would you go? And I think it depends on you and what your vision of Africa is. So I'm going to start with East Africa fast. Obviously, uh, Makati Safaris takes people into Kenya, 
Tanzania and for gorilla trekking in Rwanda. So Kenya and Tanzania, these are the traditional safari destinations, the ones of your imagination, the ones from the movies of Out of Africa or Born Free or The Lion King. All those scenes that you see in those movies, that's East Africa. The seasons here, the best season or the peak season to travel is the dry winter months. So best time is June to October. Or you could include the shoulder season, May through end of October. Another good time to go would be January to March. Lots of little animals, lots of babies being born in that region as well. For East Africa, try to avoid April. That's when the long rains come. That's where animals don't gather. That's where there's a lot of groundwater. So we don't even display our small group itineraries for April. But most people that go in the dry winter months find that the temperature is very mild, probably down to 50s in the evenings, maybe up to 80 during the day. And dry weather means wildlife have to come to waterholes or rivers to get food and to get water. So we know roughly where the herds are going to be. This is the typical Africa shot, the acacia tree spread out right across the plains of Africa. Large lion prides, um, uh, large herds of elephants, um, the tented camp, as well as people always talk to you about the migration for East Africa. So just remember the migration really is mainly wildebeest on the move. And they're on the move most of the year round. Most of you want to know when they cross the rivers into Kenya or from Tanzania, and no one can predict that. If there's a, a drought in Tanzania on the Serengeti Plains, they may cross into the Maasai Mara in Kenya as early as June. If it's not, they may not even cross till mid-July. And also remember, if that's all you want to see is the river crossing, there are a lot of uh, animals that are killed in the river, and everyone in Kenya or Tanzania wants to be there to see that river crossing, so it can get crowded as well. It's better to plan your trip around seeing as many variety of wildlife as you can. And if you can get inside one of those herds of wildebeest that spread across the plains and just sit there and enjoy the moment, it's best. We also add on gorilla trekking in Rwanda. This is be becoming more and more popular. Um, you have to be reasonably fit, but life changing when you sit next to a mountain gorilla. So let's talk about Southern Africa and why it's different. Well, in East Africa, you have more of a safari experience in different regions, but I would say 90% of your time is in safari camps or visiting the Maasai people. It is not a mix and match destination that you see in Southern Africa. So if you're a person that would like to go on safari, maybe you want to look uh, at Southern Africa, if you just want to do the safari portion for say four days and then you want something else, then possibly South Africa is the country you should look at. We do take people into South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and we jump into Zambia to show them Victoria Falls. I'm going to just talk about South Africa here because that's the other icon uh, nation for safari. And I just want you to realize this country is very large. You can see that Cape Town is at the foot of Africa and up in the Kruger National Park region, the prime game viewing region is 1200 miles away. So you have the dry winter months for game viewing up in the Kruger area and 1200 miles away in winter, you have San Francisco weather, cold, wet and windy. So you have to be careful when you're talking about traveling into South Africa. Game viewing does, the game there does not migrate, so game viewing you can do at any time of the year. Obviously, it's best in the dry winter months. Uh, in summer in South Africa, they have thunderstorms in the afternoons. However, if you were to go in the winter months for game viewing and go to Cape Town, you would find that it's Mediterranean climate and you're likely to have wind 
rain and cold temperatures. So quite often when I talk to people about Southern Africa and South Africa, I mention perhaps going in spring or fall, the shoulder months. So you get great weather in both places and you have great game viewing. Here in South Africa, you have a mix of experiences, 300 year old winery areas. You have the cultured city experience with restaurants, Table Mountain. Um, you have penguins on beaches, whales on the coastline. You can go hiking, biking, all of those activities and can add in maybe three or four days on a safari to have that wildlife experience. And then you could even add on Victoria Falls, which is an adventure area for most people. And if you've been to Africa before and want more of the wildlife situation, you might want to see the Okavonga Delta in Botswana or go in to a tented camp in Zimbabwe. So you can do a combination of countries together or you can do just South Africa as a standalone country. Differences, um, just quickly, East Africa, most of your time will be with the wildlife and tribal cultural experiences away from any kind of built up cities whatsoever. Vast plains, large herds of animals. South Africa and Southern Africa, you have the city experiences, winelands, outside activities, a mix and match of experiences and you have your game viewing. Best time to go for Kenya and Tanzania, you can go any time during the year except April. South Africa, as I've mentioned, you can go any time as well. Best to try and go in the shoulder seasons. For Botswana and the Okavonga Delta, do try to stick with the season, April to September. And for some of you, for better pricing than that, maybe the shoulder seasons will work best for you. Now, for those people that are holding on to go to India, India is an incredible destination. It's mind boggling. It has got so much to offer it and sometimes you feel a little overwhelmed by it. The best time to travel again is kind of like, I like to say late September through early April. And the best three months are December, January and February. Because they are the winter months, the temperatures are not cool, but less hot. And February is kind of like spring with all the flowers and everything coming out, beautiful colors everywhere. So 10 days minimum, I would say for India, really most of our people have like 15 or 16 days on the ground. There's just so much to see and do in India. And most of you do Northern India. So maybe five things to say about it. Obviously it is one of the oldest civilizations in the world. So it's fascinating. It is where the four major religions of the world were born and are practiced today. That's Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism. It has, it's number six in the number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It's the largest democracy and the country has the second largest population. And believe it or not, in India is the only country beyond Africa where you can find lions and rhinos. How about that? And of course, it has the magical tigers. So what can you expect when you go to people, uh, to India is of course lots of people. <laughs> Just that it has the second largest population. Yeah, yeah, there is a poverty level to India, but you're not going to see starving people, dying people on the streets, anything like that. But it can be crowded and that's why it's very important to go with an experienced company and an experienced guide. There are small temples and religious places everywhere. There, it's an architecture dream. It has all this different uh, generational Mughal architecture, Victorian architecture. Everywhere you look, it's different. It's a very much a mix of modern and old together. And it's fascinating. Obviously, it's the home of the Taj Mahal as well, which is the icon. And everywhere you look is bright colors. So if you are a person that likes to dress up in bright colors, you'll fit right in. It doesn't matter how bright, you'll still fit right in. So your senses are tested all the way when you travel with India. People like to go when there's festivals and there's festivals all year round. Two of the biggest ones are at either end of the tourist season. 
um, and our guides, all local guides, have been with us for years, uh, love to show off their country. You would stay at some of the most luxurious hotels and palaces that you can find anywhere in the world with all the mod cons. They have international chefs providing international food, so you don't necessarily have to eat just Indian food. Um, you'll be surprised at the cuisine in India. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Mercado and why I think you might want to look at us when you're going to Africa or India. There are three ways to travel with us, either in India or in Africa, and that is to start with a blank page and customize your uh, trip to your desires and your wants. This is a high-end luxury situation, and most people that custom build don't like to spend just two days in one place and move on. They want to experience different things and they want memories. And that's what Mikado gives you, is those interactions and those memories that you bring home. You could then take a small group itinerary with us. We have a number of uh, small group itineraries for Africa as well as India and our group sizes. In East Africa we go up to 18, in Southern Africa we go up to 12 and in India we only go up to 12. We have always just operated small groups. We want our safari director and our tour director to be able to make it personal for everyone in the group. The moment you start calling 28 people or 32 people a group, it's virtually impossible for the guide to have a personal interaction with every single person every day. So, and it's very important to us that it is a personal experience, regardless of whether it's India or Africa. And when countries are open, we guarantee everything. So if you happen to book onto a small group and the other people cancel, it doesn't matter. We will take you anyway. And then the third option is for those people that really can't afford the high-end customized planned uh, itinerary, but they look at some of our small group itineraries and would like to make it private to their family or their friends. So if you have six people or more, we can make any of the small group itineraries just for you. And that means that you have a private guide all the way and it's a personalized trip in India or it's a personalized trip in Africa. So there's only three ways that we take people into these destinations. So why, why Mercado? So what makes us different from all the other options you have out there? As Catherine mentioned, we are a luxury tour operator and a luxury safari operator. I could sit here and go on about all the awards we've won over 50 years. Yes, we've won the best uh, safari outfit in nine times with uh, Travel and Leisure. We're actually the only tour operator in their Hall of Fame. We've won five World Saver Awards with Condé Nast. But I think more than that, what it means is that for the last 50 plus years, we have taken care of people when they travel. We have made uh, experiences for them so that they recommend us and they bring more people back to Africa and India with us. It's up to us to give you that moment, whether it's in India at the Taj Mahal or whether it's in Africa on the plains of Africa or sitting next to a lion or a leopard. Whatever that moment is, it's up to us to give it to you. We take care of the details. Wonderful expression, hakuna matata. No worries. And that's what a luxury travel is all about. Our staff, our travel guides in India and our safari directors in Africa have been with us for many years. They're highly credentialed and they're there to take care of everything while you're traveling. And they're there to also put the magic in that itinerary for you. Our vehicles in Africa, we own our own vehicles with special suspension. Up to now, there've been nine seaters and we've only put six people in. Going forward because of COVID, we'll be putting only four people in. And we have our safari drivers as well who happen to be qualified mechanics. In India, we have a whole source of vehicles that we own, ranging from Mercedes to minibuses. Whatever works for the amount of people that are coming in is what we will do. We have a wonderful uh, concierge team, 24 seven, and they stay in major cities in India and in Africa. And these are the ladies that take care of the details. 
All of us have traveled and it's the details that matter. You arrive and the airline lost your bag. You arrive, you've forgotten your prescription medications. Your glasses broke. Um, your camera needs a battery. You're not feeling too good. Someone's sick at home, you need to leave early. You need your flights changed. This is the team available to take care of all of the above. Okay, so you're not sitting there in your hotel worrying about when your luggage is going to arrive, wondering how to find someone to fix your glasses. This team will take care of all of that so you can continue on your journey and be stress free. We do give you the Mikado bag with a wheel on it. It holds about 33 or 34 pounds of luggage. A lot of you come off cruises into Africa or cruises into India. We will store your main luggage. We ask you to pack into these uh, special Marmont design bags. Don't worry, you can fit everything in because we do the laundry for you as much as you want. You can have your clothes cleaned every single day if you want. And that means you don't have to carry as much. We've included all gratuities the big ones, the small ones, airport porters, girls serving breakfast, it doesn't matter in India and in Africa, it's taken care of. So you don't have to worry on a daily basis how much cash to carry, who needs a tip, how much you should tip, how much you need to get to a bank or an ATM. We've done all that. You just enjoy your trip. And in India, where everyone wants a tip, it becomes even more important to have all of this taken care of so you're not worrying about it. You're just enjoying the journey. All meals are in. Um, and when I say meals, you can have regional wine and beer with your meal as well. Food in Africa is fantastic. Uh, South Africa is a gourmet destination. Kenya is the breadbasket of Africa. India has international restaurants, Michelin restaurants. Uh, all of the luxury hotels have international chefs. Food should not be a concern. And any uh, food allergy, uh, vegan, uh, vegetarian, gluten-free, salt-free, whatever it is, it can be taken care of. We do do luxury safaris and luxury tours of India. We don't own any camps, hotels, lodges. We select the lodge or tented camp according to your itinerary. Location is very important. I want to explain for Africa, the tented uh, camps, kind of like a hotel room with all the creature comforts as well as the ensuite bathrooms. No problems whatsoever with flush toilets or anything like that. There's nothing like camping. This is glamping. And sometimes we use uh, city hotels, small or large hotels, country inns, large lodges, small lodges, contemporary lodges. And yes, location is important both in India and in Africa. In Africa, it's important not to have a two hour drive to that balloon launch. It makes a big difference in the early hours of the morning. So we choose things depending on where you're going. And it's up to us to get you there. If you want to sit in front of the Taj Mahal, it's our responsibility to make sure you get that intimate photograph. If it's animals you're interested in, we like you to pull back the drapes and see this. We do an awful lot of families and intergenerational families. And I just want to mention that we do use a lot of bush houses, bush villas, exclusivities. On the screen at the moment, you have a bush villa called Cheetah Plains. It's actually in South Africa. Has four ensuite bedrooms, own chef, butler, safari vehicle, safari guide, their own plunge pools, etc. And a lot of families are looking the same here in this country where you're looking to rent a beach house for the entire family. We have these villas and bush houses available for people who want that kind of an experience. I mentioned it's personal. Well, it is. Uh, the family, the Pintos, this is Jane and Felix. Felix is now in his 90s and every guest that spent time in Nairobi is invited to their home for a meal. They've been doing this for over 50 years and they have guests in their house five to six times a week. It's a highlight for our guests. They started it long before it became a trend and they just enjoy talking to guests. And they talk about every field and what you expect in your trip. Some of our guides 
get into it with you. This is, happens to be one of our top guys, Puneet, in India. He's just come from a festival with guests and they plastered him with color. These kind of experiences just last through your lifetime. Travel brings us all together. It makes us understand our world better. We should all do more of it. We do what we can. Now, why, why does Mokado exist? Well, I've got a story for you. We have a one for one. For every client that travels with us in Africa, we educate a slum child from primary school through to graduating high school. There are some 60,000 plus children in the Makuru slum in, in Nairobi. And school does cost money in uh, Kenya. So education is the only way these children will have a chance. And some 30 plus years ago, we started this. So just by traveling with Makado, you will be educating a child. We built a complete com community center with computer rooms, libraries, ladies rooms, uh, preschoolers, nurseries, et cetera, in the heart of the slum. And uh, during the pandemic, we've had to close the schools, of course, and our teachers, et cetera, are educating hut by hut, but we hope to have the schools open shortly. We also started a second nonprofit, Huru International, which makes reusable monthly supplies for young girls. And our teams go out across East Africa into the villages and supply them with the necessary needs and education that they need so that they can stay in school and again, get an education and provide a life. All of the money goes directly into the nonprofits, all administration and teachers salaries, etc., come out of Mercado. In South Africa, if you choose that as a destination, we have a similar community center in a township near Cape Town. It's called Red Hill. And if you have time in your itinerary, you are welcome to visit there as well. In India, India, we don't have the volume of people traveling, but we support seven schools and we provide them with whatever they need, com computers, food, anything like that. We also support two of the largest temples that feed over a thousand people a day. So we give them uh, staple food to help feed the homeless in India as well. So we do a lot of this uh, philanthropy and have been doing it for many, many years. And this is what makes Mercado function. This is the reason we go out and get people to visit India and Africa. So I hope you do choose it. It is up to us to make that amazing experience for you. It's up to us to show you the incredible world of Africa and India. And we will get you up close to the wildlife and give you that moment. Whether it's in India or Africa, or whether just by traveling with us, you're going to give a child a chance at a better life. And that's very, very important to us. We work with Bon Voyage Travel, and uh, we know that you're gonna spend an awful lot of money if you're going to Africa or India and decking yourself out. So we have given them a special of $250 per person credit to go into this online safari store and purchase what you need to travel without spending your money. And it's good through uh, travel to the end of 2021. So, um, Think about going to Africa, think about going to India. If you want our brochure, contact Bon Voyage Travel. They can get it out to you. You can read about our small groups, our itineraries, who we are and what we believe in. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine. I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm here in Jacksonville. There's lightning going on. So I was a bit worried that my uh, computer may not hold on, but it has. But I'm anxious to answer any questions that your guests have. Thank you, Pamela. That was great. Very, very exciting. Makes me want to travel for sure. We're all set and ready to travel again, I know. Um, I have a question here about India. As a first timer, never gone to India, what itinerary would you suggest for Mikado? Um, We have a wonderful small group itinerary. It does northern uh, India. Uh, you can find it on our website or you can see it in our brochure. It does do um, uh, all those things that people bring up and mention is on the itinerary, including the tigers. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that's a big thing <laughs> as well. 
but most first timers will go to North India and then those that go back and we have a lot that do actually go back to India for a second trip. They then branch out into southern uh, India, which is completely different to the northern, but everything that they see in films and everything is all North India. Okay. Very good. Another question now going back to Africa. Um, a question that, and I know you touched on it, and then you and I talked about it actually before getting on the webinar, but of course the million dollar question is the Great Migration. Can you just mm -hmm. find us those dates, the great, uh, the best time to go to be a part of that? Okay, most most people see the, the world to be either on the Tanzania side, usually um, May through uh, June, or on the Kenya side, somewhere between mid-July and October. Um, but the majority of people, when they talk about the migration, they are actually talking about things they've seen online where they're crossing the rivers into Kenya or back into Tanzania. And no one can, can actually tell you exactly when. It depends on the rains, it depends on the food. So what I say to them is if you go at those times a year, you'll get it on either side. And our specialists would explain it to you. If you pick um, July or August or September, they'll say, well, if you want to see the migration, it's going to be on the Kenya side. So we need to be in the Mara. And if you're going earlier, like May or something like that, they'll say, well, you need to be in Tanzania to see it. Um, so it just depends on, on the time of year that the client can get away. Um, usually in the lower um, Serengeti, uh, in the early part of the year, say January through March, that's when all the babies are born, right? But that's in Tanzania, down uh, south of the Norangora Crater. So it is a circle of life. And the only reason I like to not talk that much about it is wildebeest. I mean, the lions don't move around, the elephants, the giraffes, the leopards, the, they don't migrate. They're always there. And I always think that people that just focus on um, the wildebeest miss out all the other exciting things around them. So it's a matter of seeing perhaps both of them together. Right, right, that makes sense. Uh, what about, um, we have someone that is interested in East Africa, uh, but might have some mobility issues. Mm -hmm. Would this pose a problem? And depending what the mobility uh, situation is, if they can walk short distances, uh, if they walk with a cane or something like that, I don't see a problem. Our safari guides are very, very helpful in selecting location and camps, helping people to and from. Um, but if they have any kind of back injury where bouncing along on, un, you know, like you're going out on a safari drive, you're not exactly on roads, um, so bouncing around for a couple of hours in a vehicle, if that's going to be problematic to them, they may want to reconsider um, just because it might be easier. If the, I don't know what the disability is. Um, it depends on the disability, what destination we would actually recommend for them. But if it's just a matter of slow walking, maybe not being able to walk up hills, needing a little bit of assistance to get to the vehicle, then I don't think you're going to have any problem in East Africa. Um, but if it's more than that, uh, some people have back problems and bouncing around in vehicles is not exactly ideal. You know? And also, you know, everyone should know that definitely call us, Bon Voyage Travel, mm -hmm. call your advisor, and we can look into the itinerary that you are interested in and give you those details if it's going to work, if it's appropriate for your mobility issues or mm -hmm. not. And, we can, and, so. and what Bon Voyage does is actually, uh, if you're looking at an itinerary and you want to know more about it, um, we can put our safari specials on the phone with you and uh, someone from Bon Voyage and they can talk, talk it through, get all your questions out because our specialists have done these things many times. Right. Uh, what about, um, this is an interesting question, but I thought I would ask it. Uh, someone had asked, will there be someone to greet them at the airport? You know, yes, you're, well, in country, you're in a foreign country and there might be a, a smidge bit of angst there. So would there be someone there to greet them? Yes, um, up until the pandemic, we had uh, our staff meet you plain door. 
Um, as things are very fluid at the moment, some countries we are able to still do that, some we aren't. But believe me, uh, even with the new regulations going in in all these different countries, um, as soon as you can get through uh, your immigration uh, and collect your bags, there's someone standing there. And we're working on things to make it work better now that we can't be inside. We think that will change because we've been doing this for years and they will allow our stuff back at the plane door. But at the moment, as of today, we're having problems. Um, but we've worked with, as I said, we include all the gratuities. We know all the porters at the airports and things like that. So we're working on a system where we hope to get X amount of porters into where the baggage claim is is and they know our Mercado bag and they can go in and look for you and assist you and bring you to us um, as soon as possible. But we're working on all these details. The pandemic has kind of hindered us, particularly in India. We've always had plain door. We've always had someone as they open the plain door, they're standing there to assist you right all the way through and out. Um, but this pandemic has changed protocols. So Right now, we're working through all of these little details. By the time we get into 2021, I think we'll have this all worked out so it'll work smoothly again. Good. Uh, one last question here. Um, insects, is that a problem? Is that an issue that uh, our clients should be aware of? Um, bugs, and I presume we're talking about Africa at the moment, but uh, bugs, if you, if you travel in the dry winter months, it's not bug season. So no, it's not a problem at all. Okay. <laughs> so if you, and the temperature's low and there's no rain, it's the good time to go if you want to put it that way. So no, and also some people bring up snakes. Well, if you see a snake, you'll probably be one in a million person because I've been there 50, 60 times. I've seen two snakes in the entire time. They don't like us, we don't like them. And unless your guide is zealous and points out something to you, you will go and you won't see any snakes. So that's the other thing they ask about is snakes. <laughs> I don't know why we live in this country here and there's snakes. I live in Florida okay. and there's snakes out there. You know, I, mean, I don't know why they worry about them, but they do. That's right, right. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, that, it is. <laughs> that about does it with all of our questions, actually, Pamela. You did a terrific okay. job. You answered everyone. And uh, I think during your presentation, I think we got all of the information that we needed. But if you guys have any further questions, please call us. Reach out to Bon Voyage Travel. We're definitely here to answer your questions and any concerns that you might have. We will keep you up to date on the latest updates with COVID and travel restrictions. And we're here for you, so definitely give us a call. Also, check out bvtravel.com slash events for all of our, our August calendar of future webinars and register for those webinars there. So thanks again, Pamela. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Sante sana. Stay safe. Go well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.